So welcome everyone tuning in to this, our latest dialogue in the making sense of crypto and Web3 series. Today, I have the privilege and pleasure to be joined by Pia Mancini, who is the CEO and co-founder of the Open Collective and also the co-founder of Democracy Earth and several more projects. I think she is uh, one of those almost uh, kind of fizzing with ideas and projects uh, knowing Pia over the years. So I'm really pleased to have you here today. Pia, welcome. Thank you. This is exciting. Yeah. And I know we're going to have a kind of fairly free flowing uh, discussion, but maybe to start off, you could tell me a bit about the Open Collective and what it's up to and, and what it's about. Um, yeah, that would be great because I think it's an amazing project. Sure. So Open Collective is a solution um, for communities around the world who want to raise funds, but they don't want to become something that they're not. Right, so open source projects, mutual aid groups, social movements, right? Communities are doing the work that have, has impact in the world, but the system that we have expects them to become a corporation, right? In order to receive funds, whether it's for profit or non-profit, it doesn't matter, but you need to have a hierarchical entity. You need to be somewhere in the world. Someone needs to be a president or an executive director or have equity all the things that communities do not want to be, right? So Open Collective is a platform that allows communities to raise and spend money in full transparency. Um, and it's paired with a network of 300 nonprofits around the world that act as custodials of the funds for those projects. So if you're an open source project and the users of your um, software want to fund you because they um, want to acknowledge what you do, they want you to keep doing what you're doing, they're giving back, they're supporting the community, they're giving back to, you know, to that community. We can, you can go to Open Collective, start a collective, get hosted by a nonprofit, and in one day start receiving and spending money in full transparency. So essentially we realize that this, the way our financial system operates um, it's, it's designed for corporations that operate in a scarcity-driven economy, right? That compete with each other. And they have, they're, they're, somewhere in the, they're somewhere in the world. They're in a territory. But we are not like that, right? We, we, we've evolved into a different way of, of adding value to this world, of creating value. It's decentralized, it's abundant, it's organized online. Um, you, you might be doing something with people that you've never met face to face, but that still generates a ton of value to the world, right? But we can't, we can't support them with funding um, because our system is like lagging gazillion years behind. And so Open Collective operates in that space where um, we provide um, a platform and um, a network of, of legal entities. So these communities do not have to focus on how they're going to make money. They don't have to speak to accountants and lawyers. They don't have to go to the bank themselves. They just focus on their craft, right? They focus on the world, on the impact that they have in the world. And uh, so that's what Open Collective does. We've been doing this for six years. Um, it's a constellation of entities. Um, everything is called open and collective. That's my fault, really, because I thought like this is easy, but now it's a mess because we have like, hundreds of entities called open and collective around the world. Um, but it's a constellation, right? It's, it's the platform that is developed by Open Collective Inc., which is a company. Um, it's a for-profit venture. We'll discuss about that later, but it's also this network of, of fiscal hosts that enable all of this creativity to happen. Um, and uh, yeah, we currently, I think in the last 12 months, uh, communities and open collective raised something around $40 million. Um, we have thousands of communities of mostly, I guess there are three big areas. Um, open source projects, we're hosting 3000 open source projects around the world. 
We have um, a lot of work that we're doing in the solidarity economy. So mutual aid groups, giving circles, bail funds. Um, yeah, the whole time banks, you know, the whole solidarity, um, social solidarity economy movement, both in the US and Europe, um, it's very big. And then I guess the last area would be climate, um, climate fight, uh, or climate justice collectives and networks like uh, Extinction Rebellion or like larger social movements that they emerge in different countries at the same time. And it's ridiculous that each of those local chapters has to create their own association for doing this. So we kind of, you know, we support them all together as a network. So really it's like operating at a network of networks kind of level. Um, yeah. That's what we do. That's a, no, that's a that's a brilliant summary. So <laughs> if I just kind of play that back, <clears throat> and maybe even uh, for a moment, um, I could uh, um, just kind of put this here. If I maybe even try drawing it, just as I'm uh, I'm understanding uh, this one. So if I just understand this, like there's the Open Collective Inc. and there's kind mm -hmm. of fiscal sponsors. Yeah. Uh, is that right down here of, of various yeah. kinds? And the point is the fiscal sponsors are for if you're a nonprofit, because then you get the, the benefits of being a nonprofit. Is that, is that right? Yeah. And then and, and then essentially this this thing up here is like basically builds the platform that manages kind of people contributing money and disbursement of funds. Yes. So, it's so kind essentially of transparent, transparent finances you know, yeah. collection and, and uh, collection and, and, and disbursement of money yeah kind of the platform is it's kind of the interface that <coughs> enables all the fiscal hosts to provide these services to the collectives at a scale right so right so for example the open collective foundation has i don't know 400 collectives and manages a 13 million dollar budget right the yeah. open source collective has 3000 collectives, right? And again, like a $40 million budget. Like it would be impossible for a nonprofit to fiscally sponsor 3000 collectives. And this is like money coming in and money coming out for those collectives, like every second, right? Um, right. Without doing it on, like what enables this to happen is the platform, right? So it's all right. together. Yeah. Okay. So and sorry, make it this the open is this the open source collective? So I've got this the wrong. This is the no, open no, no, source that's another collective. one. No, no, the, you got no, it right. Quite... I told so this you. Is... I named everything and open and collective, which is a problem. You see. <laughs> yeah. But there's the open. So there's the open collective foundation, and then there's yes. open. There's the open collective Europe or whatever. I think. Yes. Correct. Yes. That's that's um, a good example. And, and these are different. So this open source collective is like three thousand, and it's about yeah. 40, 40 million, and this is thirty million, and so on. And, yeah. and these are these are basically these act as the nonprofits, and what they've got is a platform that allows them to run basically bundling transact. It's also like because small transactions are costly to do, so kind of bundles transactions together and yeah. does bookkeeping and so on. Exactly, and has like built-in mechanisms. For example, where um, if you are a maintainer of an open source project and you want to work for your yeah. community, we also provide employment services, right? So, for example, the Open Web Docs, which is a large nonprofit pro or the PHP Foundation, right, which is under our umbrella, yeah. like we hire maintainers, right? So we provide that service. Right. As well. So, okay, wow. No, so, so even like employment, uh, so this is yeah. more under these ones. This is more down here, like employment. Yes. Uh, so yeah. Services. Yeah, so kind of legal, bundle of that employment. Stuff. Yeah, exactly. You got it. Got it. No, wow. Okay, so so and so this is sort of the, the and the this is kind of providing these services to these. Okay. Yeah. That's really that's really amazing. And what what we were what I'm also hearing was that there's essentially there's a traditionally if you wanted to do this if you were a small open source project like let's say you know three part time maintainers your challenge was to receive money. Either people kind of had to sort of PayPal you or like send you something individually and there's no transparency and it's unclear. <clears throat> or you had to set up a you had to set up a company essentially in some yes. jurisdiction somewhere and deal with all of the overhead of that. Whereas yeah. now you kind of can have very transparent bookkeeping and kind of deal with all that payment. So yeah. that's that's amazing. 
And companies can now give you money, right? Because sure, you can have a PayPal account and individuals would give you money on a PayPal account, for example, even if you lack the transparency, which is, you know, it's an option, but like Airbnb or Google are not gonna be sending you money to a PayPal account if you're a maintainer, right? And like the big companies today, every single tech company under the sun uses open source project, right? So there was this thing where volunteers were, you know, working, creating work that they were releasing into the commons, into the open. And then here comes like Airbnb or Netflix or whatever. It's like, oh, this is a really cool compiler. I'm gonna use it for free because it's open source. And yeah. then they go and build their product over that. They make billions, they go public. And the folks that enabled, you know, the costs of startups to go to zero, right, at the beginning, um, yes. because the cost of accessing this technology now is zero, they weren't receiving anything, which is like yes. total oh, PS, I right? I, and I'm totally, we should come in, obviously my, the book Open Revolution, loads of stuff, we could talk more about that, about the kind of basic problems of funding, the, the, the information commons are profound. And this is what you're saying there is, Open Collective is partly helping solve that. And that's amazing. What yeah. I guess the question I've got is, and this is more of a like a geeky question here is, I know there were certain ideas like this, like there was like Gratapay. I think there were certain other services. Yeah. What that sort of ran into issue, like what issues did you have to solve? Like I remember Gratapay had some issue about like this, they couldn't do disbursements via Stripe. Like, are there some, yeah. yeah, are there some detailed, nitty gritty details you guys had to wake, work out to make this possible? Yes. So the big issue here or the, is like, we are not a money transmitter. The problem that Gratipay had was that they were receiving money for projects that they didn't have any relationship with. So the government, the IRS turned around and said like, wait, you're like PayPal, you know, you're receiving money and moving money somewhere else. You're a money transmitter. Do you have a money transmitter license? No. It's like, you know, then that's not kosher. And so what Open Collective got very early on, and this is because like we, we, we knew about that at the beginning, is that we give fiscal sponsorship. So we have a fiscal sponsorship agreement with, with each of the projects, right? Under the non-for-profits. So it's not, it's not a pass-through. So the way it works, and this is why yeah. the Open Collective platform is key here, so we received the money for an open source project. And then a maintainer is like, hey, I did this, like spend these five hours, please pay me you know, $500. They submit an invoice. We, the nonprofit reviews the invoice and it's like, do I have your tax form? Yes. Do you have enough money? Yes. Is this an, an invoice that is aligned with your mission? Yes, perfect, we'll pay it, right? And that compliance piece is what makes it all of this happen. But that wouldn't be absolutely, it would be impossible to do at the scale that we do it without the tech platform that like- Without the tech platform. Yeah. Uh, okay, and I, I mean, I think this is also just a flag to the kind of more Taoist listeners on this call is that this is an interesting example because right now we haven't mentioned blockchain. We'll come to that maybe later on the call, but we're getting at what lowered the transaction costs and made kind of collaboration at some scale possible was both a combination of technology and kind of governance structure, process, kind of process automation. If you, <laughs> in the traditional business world, it's called, you know, some it's got these, you know, process automation stuff. But absolutely, that's, I had a call. That's, 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 amazing. Talking, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah, I was talking to one of the Aragon founders not long ago, and he's like, when you started, because we all started at the same time, we just couldn't understand why you were doing something like this instead of doing like everything, you know, decentralized and DAO. We yeah. just... But now we get it. It's like because you still need invoices, you still need, and and a lot of what's happening now in the DAO space is, and, and we are having a lot of trying to help a lot of friends in the in the DAO ecosystem that they turn around and it's like we actually need invoices, you know, <laughs> like maintainers yes. of a or you know people receiving money from a DAO still need to show a payslip at one point because they need to rent a house, you know, an yeah. apartment and a landlord doesn't understand Web3. So there is that kind of, I think there is like this, this space where we, Open Collective got very good at talking with the legacy system, right? We yes. got very good at understanding how that operates and like abstracting all of that madness for like all of these communities here, right? We're like, Forget about this madness of the legacy system. It's like trying to understand, you know, I don't know, DOS or Microsoft. Don't worry, we'll, we'll do that for you. You just 
be free here and operate and, and do your thing. But we are in the middle, right? Um, I think that what we need to get better at is understanding how we, we function as a bridge between like the DAO space and the legacy system, right? Yeah. Like there is that, I see the need very clearly. I still don't see yet, like the, the solution is not crystallized okay. in my head, but I understand the need, right? I've got one other question then. So you said the crucial point is you have this fiscal relationship. So can, it, can a for-profit project or a project which isn't like work on open source software become a, become a collective? Yes, you, you, anyone can become a collective. Anyone or, can become a do... collective. Anyone can use the platform uh, for profit or non-profit. What we can, the hosts, the non-profits can't do is host a, a, a for-profit venture, right? So if you have your own, and we have companies that like use Open Collective, like Open Collective uses Open Collective, obviously, right? But other companies right. that use Open Collective to, you know, disperse money to their employees or to their contractors yeah. or whatever. That, that's <laughs> perfect and it works. It works great. We just don't provide them fiscal sponsorship services, right? Because it's Got not- it. A local tax agency will turn around and say, like, but hang on a second, you are not paying taxes here because you're a nonprofit, but you are like receiving money for a for yeah, profit vendor. Like, that's not going to run. So, in that sense, it's more like just having an open, transparent bookkeeping and kind of payment service. I got it. Yes. But that, that's, that's, so this kind of two, just to emphasize for myself and maybe this sort of two things, problems that, that are maybe related is one is, you know, um, because uh, one is like a transparent kind of, uh, or just, you know, a group, even within a company wants to kind of just do like a budgeting and so on. Because I know I've been involved with Inspiral and like co-budgeting and things like that. So it's actually not a trivial thing to kind of do um, kind of project budgeting within an organization and kind of efficiently, particularly for small amounts of money. That's one sort of almost kind of functionality that's actually hard that Open Collective solves. And there's another one, which is this kind of fiscal sponsorship at scale for groups who are nonprofit or whatever. So, okay, yeah. let's, that's amazing. I think I've got a pretty good sense of that. So I'm going to, I'm going to uh, bring us to our next point um, on, on this one, which was obviously maybe just to understand and going back to the diet, I'm not bringing it up, but the, the Open Collective itself, that there's the fiscal sponsors of Open Collective Inc. is a, mm -hmm. is a for-profit company. Yeah. And in a way you're, you're building a platform so why I think this is really fascinating again for us on this on this dialogue is that Open Collective can be um, maybe a very progressive example of a platform um, entity, which is a bit, you know, we all talk about platform and the problems sometimes of monopoly platforms and, and, and how do we have more, um, you know, participatory platforms, other things. And that's even something, again, that comes up in the blockchain type space. So maybe just the history of, of that maybe not the financial detail but obviously i understand there was like there were going to be upfront costs of building a a platform like a technology platform like this that would allow people to do this and you you guys raised some degree of venture capital money to do that um and you know and at the moment what are you so that happened and we can maybe talk about but right now you're kind of considering how to take that forward like how to evolve it and from a kind of not that you not that as a culture you're different, but at the moment at least as a structure, relatively a conventional, we've got a company probably incorporated in the United States that has received kind of investment, or I don't know where it's incorporated. But tell me a bit about that, both its yeah. background and like where you're thinking of going yeah. to. So yeah, totally. So when we started, um, I don't know, we didn't have we started in 2015, right? Early 2016. Um, the thing to do was you build a C Corp in Delaware and you raise money at a $5 million valuation because that's the valuation that people would give you money without asking um, any questions. And that's, you know, that's the path forward. And um, so that's how we started. We uh, raised on a deck, literally. Like, and this, uh, this was my co-founder, Xavier Daman. Um, so Xavier kind of raised half a million dollars on a deck um, to start to kickstart Open Collective. Um, and we ran on that for a while, like at month two or three, we started having a little bit of revenue, but it was very minimal. Um, and, and so we, the three co-founders, we had to decide kind of 
early on, okay, so what are we doing, right? Um, two of us had families, and so we needed to have a salary. It wasn't an option like to build something on the side. But that's kind of where the system pigeonholes you into, right? You're like, okay, this is gonna be my side hustle um, because I have, you know, I have another job that pays the bills, and I'm slowly gonna build it and bootstrap it, or I'm gonna try and make money. My option was, for example, I can try and make money doing public speaking, so I can finance my work on Open Collective, which is what I really want to do, right? Because I want to build something. I, I was done with talking at that point. Um, I was like ready to move into building, and but you know we needed we needed to fund ourselves, um, and at the same time. Um, yeah, that, those were the options, right? Do you bootstrap and do something else so you can fund this or you, you take money, you take venture capital? And so we just couldn't make our mind. And the reason we couldn't make our minds was because we, we understood that the Open Collective proposal was quite long-term, right? We, we, had, we took 10-year vesting, like the founders took 10-year vesting, which is like crazy for, for a tech company, which means that our our stock, our equity on the company gets kind of, you know, fully, um, fully vested or you, you fully acquired in 10 years instead of four, which is the average. But because we wanted to make sure that we gave investors um, a signal. It's like, okay, we need to take money because we don't have any other option at the moment, but this is a 10 year thing. You are with us for the long haul or you're not with us, right? That was kind of a very clear, a message and so we raised three hundred thousand dollars from friends and family to to see if we could make it work a little bit better but you know four or five months or six months down the track we were in the same position right we still weren't making enough to you know sustain ourselves um and so that was when we decided to raise a two million dollar round right but we were very lucky um because xavier um had a really bad experience with his previous company, um, Storyfy. Storyfy was a company that was an app that let you um, Storyfy tweets, right? Before, before threading and all of that happened. And he sold Storyfy and he had a terrible experience with his investor. Um, it was just very bad for him. And so he was like, he was ready to fold Open Collective before giving anyone control or even a board seat. And I promise he was ready to say like, this is not gonna happen if I need to have investors on the board or if I need to kind of give up control of the company. And so he negotiated very hard. And so we ended up raising at a really good term for very good terms for us. We have no board seats. Um, we still own full control of the company and our investors accepted those terms, which means that they understand what we're doing, right? They were ready to be you know, with us for the long term. And we never raised again. Right, that was in 2017, and we never raced again. We we lived on that. We were very frugal, and we slowly started building the business. And now we are in this position where we are profitable. We are not like you know throwing money to the ceiling or anything to the you know or anything like that. But we, like we are on the green, which is like amazing. Um, and we also called like full decision making power on the future of Open Collective. So here we are, this is this is today, right? And so I feel like we have, there's, there's a part here moving forward that is very selfish, that is about like what is my role and the kind of executive um, leadership role on Open Collective in the future. And we see ourselves as stewards, right? We still think that if you take a 50 year view of what we are doing of the world, what we find true today, communities need a mechanism to fund themselves without becoming something that they're not, is true today and it's gonna be true in 50 years. The mechanism might change, right? It doesn't matter, but the need is gonna be there. We, we are sure of that. And so, but we are not gonna be there. Right, so it's forcing us to think about of ourselves as, you know, a cohort, a set of stewards, and then figuring out what's the mechanism for who's coming next. Right, so there's there's a part about thinking of the future of Open Collective that has to do with with the leadership's role and how we can, you know, pass on the baton to someone else for them to take over and continue the mission. Um, and then there's another part of that that is like less selfish that has to do with um, how can we make it make our, 
a roadmap, a blueprint for other open collectives like us, for other companies like us, to avoid the trap of only thinking of, um, okay, I'll take VC money and then I have to sell the company or I have to go public, right? Because those are the two options that you have going forward. And what we want to do, because we are in this kind of super privileged position in the sense that we're, you know, we're doing relatively okay and we have great investors and we own control and we don't need to fundraise. So like we can carve a space for more companies like Open Collective that start as a company, but at a company that, that there, are com there are companies that don't have as their sole mission, maximize value for their shareholders, right? That is not who we are, that's not what we do. But companies like us are weird, right? Um, and there are not a lot of options. So when we think about Open Collective, we're thinking very much in the public about this because we want to create a space for other companies like us to figure out like a sort of third way, if you want, right, forward. And, and so let's just, let's just kind of, I don't know whether it's helpful. Um, I'm gonna try again with my uh, wonderful live drawing here. So th there's the kind of situation I should put in here. There's, there, there, were, there was kind of, there were investors, right? At some point. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so this is a classic setup of most companies. Like we could have X, Y, Z company and particularly a platform company. Yeah. You've got, I mean, I, what I should draw, which is important in this diagram is uh, lots of, uh, lots of, uh, lots of users over here, maybe. Yeah. Uh, uh, who are user, you, so this is our users. And um, what I understand that you guys are kind of thinking about is how does, how do you steward the platform forward and so the kind of traditional options would be that that basically classically for startups particularly a platform startup would be like one would be kind of ultimately ipo two would yeah. be sell and three would be just kind of continue to own own forever um or, exactly or which at is some terrifying point, <laughs> but 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 it's but i mean i i can think of one example like that i mean that people maybe are familiar with like base camp i don't know like yeah. heinemann hansen and and they just don't seem to be going away. They're just going to keep running base camp till, till you know, or, or 30 exactly. seconds signals till, till the day they die. Um, but I mean, I think of maybe a more famous example that might be on people's mind. It wasn't a platform company, it was, was um, um, ThoughtWorks, which was obviously a very, uh, I, don't, I don't, probably you know ThoughtWorks. ThoughtWorks was a um, kind of amazing uh, technology. They were kind of a software development company. They were more yeah. of a consultancy company. The, you know, some of the leading figures in like patterns and agile work there still do, but they basically sold out to a private equity company. I think they're kind of founding owner about, I don't know, five, 10 years ago, and they've now recently IPO'd. And obviously, I don't know, I think they seem to have an amazing culture, but one obviously has that question that like 10 years down the line with the pressure to make quarterly results, will it have the same Absolutely. Um, experience? So that, that own, what I'm saying is, uh, I think that was an example there is the own forever, often at some point, maybe it's that the, you know, suddenly you need to provide for an, an important operation of your grandkids or something like whoever the story in, you know, 50, 30 years time, that, that often becomes IPO or sell. And that's yeah, yeah. the traditional route. And, and then the pressures that that brings kind of financially. And what you're, what I'm understanding is you're asking, are there others? Are there other options that we could create for this yeah. and i mean obviously there are some famous ones it's like be a cooperative yeah um and then i think you're we're about to talk about it's like kind of steward ownership of some kind yeah um now just just to, just to say um maybe it would be good for you just to describe what your some of the th options you've been thinking through here um yeah. and then we can discuss a bit maybe what I, i'm kind of also intrigued why we end up you know why do we end up so much in option one or two is it just the evils of capitalism but let's leave that question for now. It'd be really great if you walked me through a little bit what what the what what are the possibilities you you've been thinking yeah. about. So the other thing about Open Collective, I guess, is that it's a community first company, right? Like different from ThoughtWorks, for example. Our our yeah. clients are communities, right? Our clients yes. are are social movements, are open source projects, if you want. Like those are. Yeah. That's the community we serve. And we have a huge community, right? That is a community of yeah. communities, essentially. So, so when we are thinking about ownership, 
the second thing that I would say about Open Collective is that because of our mission, we understand ourselves as infrastructure for the commons, right? Yes. We're not selling a service like a SaaS provider. Um, we are infrastructure that the commons is using to become sustainable, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so when we think about ownership going forward, we we very, very strongly think that the commons should own the technology that it uses to sustain itself, right? There is something about that makes me cringe about, and this is, you know, like the idea of a public company that is owned by investors that look at the bottom line every quarter and that public company is actually the lifeline of the commons, right? Of all of these communities. So that's what in particular about Open Collective makes make this process almost like fundamental. Because think about, for yeah. example, imagine yeah. Facebook groups, right? Remember Facebook groups? Everyone was using Facebook, Facebook groups to organize, like yeah. way back when, you know, when Facebook yeah, way back. <laughs> Way I, remember. Remember. I know, I know. I'm, 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 yeah, we, we're both, you know, I wasn't born, <laughs> I'm not a centennial, <laughs> but way back when people used um, Facebook groups to organize. And then Facebook so was like, oh, we're just going to tweak with this algorithm here. And so your community, the, your reach, like dropped 10 times, 20 times, right? Overnight. Yes. Because of how the, What's the, the algorithm word? The, yeah, yeah, the algorithm. Newsfeed. Uh, yeah, yeah. The newsfeed thing. I haven't had Facebook for like six years or seven years. So the newsfeed algorithm um, works, right? So, so that's what I'm. That, that's what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Or, or Twitter, for example. Imagine if Twitter tomorrow is like you're. We're only going to show your tweets to this community here, but not these ones because these are paying and these ones are not paying. For example, and yes. suddenly you're, you know, between big commas your town square you know and we can talk about if twitter is or not, it's not a town square it doesn't matter but you know the thing you used to communicate with your community is suddenly like you know it's like they pull the rag from under your feet right so we can we this is we feel very strongly that open collective cannot we cannot put the community in that position in in, in the open collective Okay, so right. the infrastructure needs to be owned by the community that it's that it's using it. And and you've made a great point there. That the points you're making about open collective, while it may be a small one and one you have control of, really apply to these much bigger examples. I mean, I mean, Google, you know, Google controls what I find, you know, people finding my information and, and let alone having you know, not alone even having any democratic say, I don't even have transparency about the algorithm works. And I mean, just to add to your stories, and it may be a commercial story, someone I used to work with, and now this is over a decade ago, I mean, their com company basically shut down because of the, the Google search rank algorithm change, where their company went from being profitable pretty much overnight to unprofitable. And there are other well-known stories about Google or others. And, or and, GitHub, and, right? And great, GitHub was yeah. acquired by Microsoft. Imagine like the panic, <laughs> you know, that for a while there, yeah. like, all of these millions of open source developers had when a company that used to call open source a cancer bloody bought the, 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 the platform that you used to develop your work, right? Uh, and that you used, it's insane. Yeah. So the question, the question, I mean, I want to come to what you're exploring, but maybe it's just worth a detour now for ourselves to ask, why does that happen? It seems like, a, you know, and the answer to that, which is the coordinating uh, I mean, it, it's worth asking ourselves and perhaps the broader audience, because lots of people out there, and I, I include myself, I think I say, but this is clearly, it would be a much, just once, uh, it would be. A Pardon me. Just um, that, that uh, why does this happen? And I think it's good to go back to, because you guys are clear, I mean, I just really want to acknowledge I mean, first of all, I know what it takes to build a company, to make it work, to get viable, all the things, the time and effort that's been put in, and that you're thinking so deeply about this question. And you guys were very wise in how you took investment, and you took investment. And of course, the truth of many companies, whether it's, you know, uh, 
Twitter, Google, or Facebook. I mean, people even forget with Facebook. I don't know at what point Facebook actually became profitable. Um, I mean, probably perhaps maybe very early. We st- I don't, I've never quite, but many of these companies or like, you know, Uber's another good example is like different platform environment where the understanding is they're still maybe not fully profitable, at least yeah. overall. There's this huge upfront costs that, and, and sort of that's, it's the that story where you kind of sell the farm, you sell the, you know, to, to be able to have a farm, you kind of sell your rights to your farm at the beginning. You know, that even if those founders of Twitter or, or, or Google or, or, or whatever wanted to have been different, or even Mark Zuckerberg wanted to be different, he probably couldn't because essentially he's promised those investors returns or, you know, and, and often then yeah. some degree of, you know, financial kind of uh, interest. So I just guess yeah. the question that we, that, 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 that is at the source of this, even for yourselves, as you said in your story, which was really accurate, you needed, um, you need upfront capital to get going. And so, but, and I think that's worth returning to, which is because what you're also going to talk about is now you're in this position with a lot of freedom. What could you do? And could that exemplify, you know, if Mark Zuckerberg wanted to be inspired by this story, what could he perhaps, because in theory he has both, I, I still have voting, 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 voting control. <laughs> <laughs> but, but my question is, so maybe tell what me else? about what the options are now, and then we can come yeah. back to this question of how they could even apply earlier in the chain. So If yeah. I had to do this again, if I had to start Open Collective today, I would start a steward owned company, right? right? I would, so the big, so today the world is, it's better in a sense, like you have, there are investors that are investing in steward owned companies. And, you know, steward owned companies like Bosch is a steward owned company, like it's huge, yeah. right? Like Novo Nordic, like there's a lot of like knowledge and, sharing of, of novel um, corporate structures that I didn't have before, right? So I would probably start a company in Europe. So the problem is that there's a big difference between Europe and the US as well, right? When you start a company in Europe, your valuation is at a discount to begin with because you're not in the US, right? So, so your valuation, you need to knock off 1 million or two of the price just because you're not in the US right, of the valuation of the company. Now, that is not necessarily bad because valuations of the company are like, you know, are like random number generators, to be honest, um, especially at the beginning. But, and there's a lot of capital, a lot more risky capital or capital that is not risk averse in the US, right? And in the US, these steward owned companies are more progressive type of structures that exist in Europe and have existed for decades in Europe, like they're not existing in the US. Like that doesn't happen. They don't get it. They look at you and like, they, they just don't get it. So you need to, when you start today, you need to think, I guess, more broadly about what you, it's easier to do it in the US because you file in Delaware, it takes you five minutes and you turn around and I'm like, I'm worth $5 million, give me money. And you have like a list of, you know, people saying like, sure, I'll give you money, you know, which is insane, but that doesn't happen in Europe. But at the same time in Europe, you have like much better. So anyway, so I would start like a steward of company, which is a company that, so a, a corporation, um, and this is something that changed, you know, it wasn't always like that, but the, the goal, the, the, the object of the corporation, the, the purpose is to maximize value for the shareholders, right? And that is like money in the pockets of those who own it. That's how it's defined. And as a CEO, as a founder, that is your responsibility. The board can kick you out if you're not maximizing value. That's your fiduciary responsibility, right? That's what you're supposed to do. So it's like this perverse incentive system that puts you in that position, right? So you pair that with like these liquidity levels that are unseen, or have been like completely unseen or unheard before, that you have the venture capital model where the goal is I'm gonna fund all of these different projects or startups, and I don't care because I know that there's gonna be one unicorn that is gonna save my fund, right? So that's the game, right? The game is like, I'm gonna give to all of these. So I have one that's gonna make me a hundred X and then that's that, and then everyone's happy. Um, and so all of the incentives are really perverse, right? You, the, 
this system like forces you essentially to hyper growth or to try to hyper growth, right? Because mm-hmm. the only thing that matters is growth, right? Yes. And, 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 and this is Uber and this is, you know, we work and we crashed, you know, it's like, we need to grow, 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 earn, like eat the market, you know, like own market share as much as possible. The only thing that matters is the numbers. It doesn't matter how solid it is. It doesn't matter if you are, if you have other like externalities, right? And also when you have a community as your core, then it means that you're just essentially selling your community, right? Because you need to yes. make money off your community. It doesn't matter how, right? Yes. So everything is like, like forces you to this kind of hyper growth and spend to grow, you know? It doesn't really matter to spend to grow, then you raise more, you have a higher valuation and that's a freaking game, right? And then at the end of the day, you IPO, you sell, you pay everyone and that's that. So, you know, there's some things that have been appearing like B Corps, you know, and things like that, that are trying to, to add another purpose to the goal of the company that is not just maximizing value for your shareholders. I think it's like greenwashing essentially right yes sure whatever like i'm also gonna have you know good impact in the world you know (laughs) like okay great how's that going so what i like about the steward own company model and the models that we're looking at and what i would do if i had to start again today would be i would i would i would i would inscribe in the dna of the corporate like the corporation itself would have a different purpose the mission of the corporation would be the mission of um, the startup of the project, right? At the core, our role as stewards is to make sure that the mission is supported and it's and it's um, protected, right? And if that means you know not making that much money, then that's fine because the mission is the it's the the purpose. Um, and so you would have like a set of stewards that are like some sort of like oversight board, if you want, who essentially are the ones who are, you're decoupling economic ownership from decision-making ownership, right? Which is the, it's part of the, you know, the issue here. Part of the issue of the traditional model is that you have economic ownership and decision-making ownership. You have a board, everyone looks at the bottom line and they're like, this is what you have to do because you're not growing fast enough, right? And that's where the decisions are made. In a steward's own model, you are separating economic ownership from decision-making ownership. You can still have investors and they own the equity and you can you know, give dividends to them, but the company is run by those, by those who are involved in the day-to-day and those are making the decisions and those have the task to protect the mission, right? So incentives are very different, right? Because the what what the the first thing that you're looking at is like okay how can, how can we grow this mission how are we doing better for ourselves for our community so if I'm just understanding right basically the point is that the 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 the, 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 yes. the shareholders are, um yeah just the, there's there's um there's this going on and there's there's essentially um this there's kind of like the governance control which is the key thing is 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 yeah. is, is, is like this so i mean to put well, this way, have, so. yeah and the other arrow wouldn't be there right the this one. yeah exactly or, not, or they might have some say or they might have none even it's an option you can give them whatever yeah, it's not that's why i'm putting i'm putting it stash it may uh-huh, may have it. some say but uh-huh. i've just got it which is to say that they kind of get dividends uh you know like or you know r- return you know some you know or whatever etc so the, yeah. just just to say this is this point, um, what I think also to emphasize, this is quite old in that you could have governance. I mean, even take Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg has different levels of voting control than economic interest. I think he has voting control actually of Facebook. Um, but the point here is that you're gonna vest control in these stewards who are sort of the, the kind of look out, they're gonna be the stewards of what? They're the stewards of the, of, of the purpose of, of the company, yeah. of the kind of the, the purpose. And I obviously want to shout out here. I think we both, Armin and his colleagues at Purpose, yeah. uh, I think Purpose Economy, who we both know who, who's inspired both of us in, in some of this thinking. And um, so 
I think this is this this is great. And so what you're saying is this is how you'd start if you were starting Open Collective Day. Yes. And this is also where where you're thinking of maybe evolving Open Collective towards yes. as well. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Totally. So the our challenge because you know we never do things in KC, unfortunately, is that we started with a different corporate model yeah. and we're trying to pivot, right? And, and that is, but we already have investors, we already have a board, we have a cap table, you know, like we have the whole thing that comes yes. with having a company. Uh, so in 2017, I think, or 2018, we went to all our investors and we said like, this is what we want to do, you know? We want to do a, in the future, we want to be steward own. What do you think about that? You know, we're thinking in a you know, shared revenue model, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, are you making money? Nope then go make money and then we can talk right and so it was like very clear they were like sure whatever but you're still losing money every month so I think you should focus on that first um, and so we you know we need to do a lot of not a lot but we need to do some convincing some explaining some you know we need to change their shares reissue shares you know the whole thing and so so we went back we were like okay we'll Fair, that's fair. So we, we went back 2018 and we decided to just build a company and be profitable, right? Which is the state where we are at the moment. But so we're thinking like, how do we do this going forward? And we have a couple of options. Um, essentially what we are trying to do is not to have a steward on company anymore. You know, that was, that's what I would have done if I, if I had to start today. But what I want to do now is to have the community owning Open Collective, right? The community that it serves. Again, like Open Collective as infrastructure for the commons, how do you make the commons be part of the, the ownership, not just the governance, like the ownership of the platform, right? Yes. Um, and, and so that's, that's what I'm trying to do. That's what we are trying to do. Right. We are trying to transfer ownership of, of the company to a community. Now, challenges like galore, right? Because the community is like a non, it's like a non entity, you know? It's, 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 it's a growing and changing and shifting network of networks. Um, and the community is as much the individuals, the collectives, the nonprofit, the employees, right? Our investors, like everyone is part of this. Um, so, so we started uh, a thinking in public process um, that we call E2C. We didn't invent the name, but it, we, we took it from Cibras Unite and Nathan Schneider and the work that they're doing at at, the, at their lab, etc. But essentially, it's an exit to community, right? How do you exit a company, but instead of exiting to an IPO or to another company, you exit to a community? So employees, founders, investors get a chance to de-risk, right? To get paid for all the risk they took early on. Um, but instead of that, liquidity being provided by a different company or like publicly by you know an IPO, it's provided via a mechanism by the community at large, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's a couple of ways to achieve this. One is a DAO, right? Like DAOs essentially that's what they are, right? They they start as a pro some DAOs start as a like Gitcoin, right? They start as a company and they're like, we're gonna exit to community by you know, a token sale or, you know, by issuing tokens um, of governance and ownership of the project itself. Yeah. That's, that's definitely one option. Another option is doing a purpose trust, right? Which is you create a trust. A trust is essentially a very flexible um, corporate mechanism you can do a trust for whatever you want, right? You can do a trust to put money in there to take care of your pet when you're gone. It doesn't matter. It's just a trust. A trust is like an entity that protects a certain uh, purpose, a goal. Um, what I like about trusts is that 
they solve the for-profit, non-profit issue quite elegantly, right? Because a trust is a non-profit entity, but it can share dividends and revenue, right? It can pay out dividends and revenue. Um, and so a trust would start owning shares of open collective, right? And you can do this progressively, you can do this in one go. It, it really depends on, on, on you know, how much liquidity you need and the, and the financial um, situation of the company, et cetera. But the goal here would be for the shares of Open Collective to progressively be transferred or bought by a trust. The purpose of the trust is the mission of Open Collective, right? The purpose of the trust is to ensure that the communities, you know, that the mission is sustained, that we enable a mechanism for communities to support themselves in full transparency, right? And now, then obviously the devil is in the details, and this is why this is a very much kind of learning in public um, conversation. You can have um, a board of trustees, you can have steering committees. How do you involve the community in the actual ownership, right? You can have, I imagine, for example, you every quarter, like open collectives, you know, income is divided between paying out more shares and then distributed to, distributing to the collectives, right? Um, there's who, who's gonna put, come up with the liquidity to pay for the shares, right? Is it gonna come from evergreen purpose investors who want to see open collective transferred to the commons? And so they are putting money to pay out existing investors who with, you know, with us for six, seven years and they want some of their money back. Or the founders or the employees. <clears throat> yeah. And then how you do the governance of the thing is like a really difficult proposition. Right. From my experience in, in politics, um, and you know this well, but when you talk about participatory democracy or participatory <laughs> politics, part of the problem that you face is that folks don't really know how to participate and they don't really know because they've never done it. Right. So we are well, like, I, yeah. Yeah, because we're like, okay, you come and vote every two years. And then one day we are like, oh, we have a, an issue, right? We can't solve. We're just going to do a referendum. And then the public can decide because, you know, participatory politics. And you're like, whoa, hang on a second. Like, that's not how it works. You need to, you need to, le to learn. You need to fail. Um, you need to be able to fail in order to learn. You need to experience the ownership and the participating in order to know how to own and participate, right? So, um, so what we want to do is, so the thing I absolutely want to avoid is like two years down the track, having everything set perfect with the, you know, corporation, the transfer, the money, the thing, and then turn around and tell the community, now you need to govern this thing, bye, you know, like, yeah. and so, so for us, the whole learning in public um, in, um, process now has to do with how do we, learn together with our community to own and govern something like Open Collective, right? So that's the process that we're in. And I think that that is fundamental for, to the success of this, right? Because at the end of the day, what we want is for Open Collective and the communities that it supports to be successful and sustainable for the future, right? But we need to learn our community and ourselves, we need to learn together how to govern this. And that's not gonna happen overnight. So kind of involving everyone in the decision making, and this is not deciding by committee or designing by committee or like, ultimately this is our responsibility and it's, you know, we own this thing today. It's our responsibility to like transfer that, right? And it's gonna be our decision, yeah. but we can't do it, you know, com this is not common, like co communities normally do not own tech. And they don't have to pay like developers and maintain a tech platform, no. right? So we need to learn how to do it together, essentially. Well, that that's that's an interesting question. Because so to just first of all, let me if I, I don't know if you can see my screen, but I think I'm trying to start, so this kind of there's there's sort of the situation today that had investors and their users, and the users mm -hmm. currently pay like a, basically implicitly they pay a, they pay a they pay a small user fee. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, like which is a percentage of their, their kind of um, um, wait a minute um, that's the 
there's there's uh, I don't know what I've done to my arrow there. Okay, um, they pay some percentage of their user. They, there's, there's this user fee, which is some percentage of their of, of of their their monthly budget or whatever. Or when they pay pay transactions, there's a transaction fee of some kind. Yeah. And what you're trying to say is there's this steward ownership where there's this diffusion between the stewards, the economic stakeholders. But I want to move to community ownership. The difference basically is the economic stakeholders become the community members and mm -hmm. the community have some role in appointing the stewards. Mm -hmm. that, that's essentially the difference in community ownership. Is, is that right? Yes. Uh, have I done the diagram right? That's why I'm che checking. And, yeah, yeah, and yeah. what you were saying is a trust. Trust is a nice model for the actual yeah. holding entity down here. Well, I think... I mean, I'm aware of time today, but maybe we just keep running because this is such a fascinating conversation at the moment. I'm coming coming to our hour. Because um, there's a lot of things. I mean, there's kind of what we go to is some of the heart of like why and, and even heart of why um, organizational design um, is, is hard and why we maybe haven't had solutions to these questions over hundreds of years. It isn't like because we haven't had like DAOs or blockchain or something that these some of these things involve fundamental kind of trade-offs that that there may not that and, and it goes to a deep question i have about like do we solve these you know, technology can help things like we can send emails much faster than we can write letters but that doesn't necessarily mean we can innovate in democracy that much because yes that they're th so what i'm trying to understand is where technology helps us and where it doesn't because one of the claims often in the Taoist type community is like oh wow we've got this you know because of blockchain and because of this technological infrastructure we can kind of just do things we couldn't do before i mean like i'm like at least me, I'm a little bit like, wait a moment. Um, mm. What, because what you're describing here is, I mean, the classic trade off is stuff like, um, let's just pick out some here. Um, you, you, you mentioned them like, well, people, you know, one, let's just pick out some. One is participation in governance. That requires mm. a bunch of expertise, time, and energy. Why, why even in classic corporations do we have a board of directors rather than every, the, sh the shadows don't get together every day and vote on management decisions? Exactly. And they do that because there's intentional costs. Um, and so the challenge often is that this requires, uh, and it leads to politics, or kind of it leads to a lot of energy for people to in, be involved in this. In a current setup, in a way, the, the, users, the users only have to make a decision, which is, do I use Open Collective or not? Do, if they don't yeah. do what they want anymore, I can leave. And this other one, they suddenly become a shareholder where kind of, I mean, they can leave, but they've got this problem that they're, that they're now like in charge of the yeah. governance of a platform. Yeah, um, yeah. No, it's, I, I, um, we can yeah. talk about, it. I just, just want to name another one. And your other point was basically raising capital. So mm -hmm. you mentioned this and it relates to co-ops, which is another topic I'd like to cover in the series. The challenge corporates, which obviously have, we haven't even mentioned, but corporate ownership of, of something involves everyone owning an equal share is classically a problem of raising capital. And you mentioned this, which is how do we provide, I think you said several times, how do we provide liquidity to early investors? Or if we, you know, I don't know, let's say this suddenly XYZ evil corp um, mm. starts out doing something like open collective, but mm. with some attractive offer, but in the long run, it's going to exploit, you know, once it's got in yeah. charge, it's going to charge exorbitant fees. Maybe you'll be like, oh, we need to innovate and we need to at least compete and market ourselves against evil corp that might require capital and so there's a question both of early investors and potential additional need for capital yes. at some later point yeah yeah um, absolutely absolutely and, 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 and there's this question of how will that happen um you know and and, and not, you know can you issue you can't really issue equity anymore so you maybe you have to, you can issue loans but then you know it, there's, there's some kind of complexity that co-ops yeah. will regularly run into in capital raising so do you want to speak to those questions at least? You, I mean, there's so much attractive about this model. It's amazing. Yeah, and that, that I, think I don't. Clearly want, we, we, want, we want community owned platforms and yeah. infrastructure. That's what we want. Yeah, I don't, I don't have all the answers. And this is part of the, yeah, <laughs> you know, the, 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 but, but, you know, is, exactly, literally, this is part of why, because we don't have all the answers. And, you know, I like tough problems. And this is, you know, this is one of them. Um, and so how do you, I think that this would be very difficult proposition for a startup, right? If you're starting something, you need a lot more like upfront capital, right? So you don't even have a community yet, which is part of what a lot of DAO, you know, um, DAOs or crypto projects run into. They have more capital than communities, right? Um, 
But so not from the habit of some degree. But. It's some, sometimes. I think that too much money sometimes without a community just makes it's you just absolutely. But it doesn't matter. Absolutely. Let's not go on that, but yeah. Yeah. Um, but we, I guess that we need to evolve, right? We need to evolve as, um, as a society. We need to evolve as communities. We certainly have you know, access to... Um, to funding, we have access to ownership. So how do we do that, right? How do we organize um, this? You know, when we started Open Collective for the open source community, we had that very question. It's like, wait, open source projects are now gonna have um, money, right? So suddenly you have the problem of a community that has money. And so you have all of these governance problems that before you didn't have, right? Because before you didn't have to deal with money. Um, so, so yeah, exactly. So the difficulty here is like learning how to do this together. So a couple of things that we're doing, we are having, you know, first a lot of, um, we're, we're starting like this town hall podcast series about this. We're doing PB, we're doing participatory budgeting with the community, right? Because we need to start kind of, again, I think it's so important that communities learn how to fail, right? That someone gives them the opportunity of making a bad decision without that being the end of the world. Right? Because yes. that's the only way you learn. You need to make mistakes. And if there's no room for mistakes, then you, there's no room for learning. So we want to like set aside um, budget that we are you know, ready to lose in a sense to just for, for for this because I think it's crucial. So participatory budgeting, we also have like um, solidarity schools, right? So we're kind of training folks and, and networks and building that kind of weaving that community. Um, and at the end of the day, it's obviously not going to be a, um, a direct democracy kind of process. Like we, you know, I don't even have sure. to argue with you of all people that that doesn't really work. But right, so we're not we're not gonna go down that road of like everyone should vote on the feature that we're gonna build next because everyone's got crazy. So this is gonna be like a company that's gonna be run like a company that's gonna have a platform. It's just that the goal is not gonna be maximizing value for shareholders. The goal is gonna be maximizing our mission, right? And then yeah. revenue is not going to be siphoned out to um, those who have economic ownership. It's going to be distributed um, to the community, to the investors, to the employees, to the founders. Like, you know, at the end of the day is that, right? That's, that's what we want to achieve. Um, and then we'll need to see how it grows. You know, we need to see what the next challenges are. We need to see how... Again, open Collective is also an open source platform. We're super transparent, so others can take this on. And maybe, you know what? There's an acknowledgement about about everything that tomorrow we might not be needed anymore because our mission is not, you know, there. The need is not there anymore, and that's okay, right? Like we're here to serve a purpose, right? If that purpose is like served, right, and it's not a need anymore, then we shouldn't be existing either. You know, there's something about creating structures that that need to, to 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 be kept in the world just because they're already here that I think of we course. need to start changing, right? Of course. And I think I think that's a brilliant point to bring us to. I mean, I think I think A, that's a wonderful acknowledgement of the need to compost like I think, you know, our attachment to um life is often the source of death i mean i it's most visible in um the climate crisis i mean at, at life itself we have another project called wet cream for a passing age we need to be able to have a decent a generous funeral for our past to be able to create a future if we always are holding on and of course i often mention harry potter uh voldemort if, if you've got children you'll <laughs> certainly be familiar with harry potter but voldemort can't be with death uh it can't be with like dying so of course he creates death everywhere yeah. um yeah. It's an old story. So that's a beautiful point to end. I just want to like, I want to bring just to acknowledge, first of all, I just think it is exceptional. I mean, that the, also the rigor and depth of, of not thinking, but I also think process. So you mentioned the things you were sensitive, like practicing participatory budgeting, you know, th this point about um, <clears throat> solidarity schools, just the fact, as you said, 
everyone says, of course, we need to have room to learn. You know, we need to be able to fail to learn. Everyone says that as a kind of cliche. Who, but the, the courage to actually do it and to put money uh, in as a still a you know a relative startup, I just think is incredible. So I really want to acknowledge you, Pia, and the whole team. And I know uh, there's a wide team at Open Collective for the amazing work yeah. that is being done here, and and both in the platform itself, but in this kind of innovative and and practical thinking. I think that's the other aspect, actually trying it out. So. Yeah. really deep acknowledgement and I wish we left like a whole nother episode here of discussion to follow on about how this would relate and I'm not going to go into DAOs and Web3 and other things and, and just more generally um, you know I mean you mentioned hyper growth and the problems of digital capitalism I think it's whole topics but I want to kind of end there for today and just really thank you I think it's been a fascinating exploration of the questions which are at the heart of some of I think the Web3 and crypto aspirations or the general aspiration of how do we build um, fairer, more participatory, more collaborative, um, you know, ways of organizing, of building, especially in the information age, especially in terms of technology and information platforms. And this is a, a really like kind of shiny example of that. So thank you so much for joining us today. And if sure. there are any last words you'd like to share or any links or anything you'd like people, obviously there's opencollective.com. I think there's opencollective.com slash uh, P, uh, PPT. Um, Interesting. P well, there's E2C and there's, there's yes, and the Perpetual yes. Purpose Trust. So any other links you'd like to share with the audience, I will also put them in the show notes. Please say now anything else you'd like to leave us with. Uh, no, I'm really happy to have had this conversation. It was, um, you know, it just reminds me of why we're doing what we're doing. <laughs> and that's very important. But I guess like to your, to your point, um, you know, the just a gentle reminder that the challenges are cultural, they're not technological right and so we need to think about like technology in the context of culture otherwise it doesn't it's not going to change anything totally and that's a brilliant brilliant point i call it the primacy of being uh point i think is brilliant um and we might go to that another topic yeah and i think and how they go together and that and that work uh, is is the deep work and that's what i also acknowledge that you seem to be really doing well thank you everyone all the listeners thank we're you. please tune in for follow-up episodes you can Follow more at web3.lifeitself.us and until the next episode, thank you.